I just want to share real briefly here today for two hours until I get hungry. <laughs> just some things that, uh, that are on my heart. I don't have, you know, like a three-point you know, sermon, but I have like a 40-point sermon. And so I'm just going to jump around like a schizophrenic preacher. And um, there's some things that I just want to minister to here uh, in this atmosphere and to where you guys are as a church. And so I'm going to do my best to communicate what I feel uh, is going on and what God wants to do. And I'm going to share it through the scripture and uh, if the shoe fits where. But uh, I come to encourage you and I think uh, on Wednesday night I'll be back. And I believe that we're going to kind of build uh, on this. So it will be like a part one and part two, so to speak. Um, and so today's message if it had a title. It would be entitled Times of Transition. Because um, I really believe that your church is in a transition. And uh, the thing is that uh, I, believe, uh, I believe that your church is in a transition. And um, with that being said, how we respond in times of transition is very, very crucial. And it's very important. Uh, I'll give you an example. If if a, if, a, if a storm comes, okay, to a boat that's out fishing, then what happens is all hands have to be on deck. Right. You understand? And so now is the time for you who feel that you're supposed to be here to get involved and to serve because God is continuing to lay the foundation of this house and this church. And if you want it to be what God wants it to be, then you have to put your hand to the plow and never look back. That's right. Amen. The children of Israel were about to go into the promised land, and um, there was this one tribe who was willing to settle for the second best. And uh, they didn't want to go over to cross the Jordan. And Moses said to them, Do not, uh, don't not fight because your brethren will be discouraged. And so what happens is when people don't play their position, it releases discouragement on other people, and it causes leaders to burn out. And so I, I want to just say that it's really, really crucial, and it's really important that you play your position, and you take whatever God is telling you to do seriously. And let me give you an example. Let's say what God is telling you to do is something that's maybe, let's say, it's outside of the church. It's not necessarily vacuum in the sanctuary, but it's something else like feeding people or going door to door or just ministering. Just If you do what you're supposed to do out there, it changes the atmosphere in here. The Bible says that when the righteous rejoice, there's great glory. The reason a lot of times we don't experience real great glory is because we don't live righteously. So then what we try to do is we try to fast and pray and console God to do something that He would only do if you live right. Mm -hmm. See, before Jesus taught His disciples how to pray and how to do any of that, He taught them how to live. He taught them how to respond. He taught them to be of another spirit. See what I'm saying? He taught them to live in such a way that when they speak to God, He responds to them. In the kingdom of God, the way we live is, is so, so, so important. And it's often something that really gets neglected because we, we focus on the grace of God, and it's true. God is merciful, and what you did yesterday is over. That's true. But if you continue to do tonight what you did last night, mm. then you're not learning. Right. And you're in bondage, mm. and God doesn't want you in bondage. Mm. Jesus paid a huge, huge price for you not to be in bondage. Everything that he's purchased for us in the kingdom was paid for on the tree. Yes. Mm -hmm. The cost, see, we you don't want to make the message of the kingdom cheap. Mm -hmm. yeah, <clears throat> the kingdom is not having a nice building. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's not the kingdom. That's not the church either. You're the church. And the kingdom is where Jesus is ruling and reigning. Mm -hmm. 
And so I'm going to get into that more on Wednesday. But what I want to talk about is there's something that I just, it, it just, it, you know, sometimes you read something and you can read it over and over and you don't really get it until God breathes on it and gives you a revelation. So I was reading Matthew chapter 1. This is not Christmas message, but mm -hmm. I was reading Matthew chapter 1. And it says this in verse 1. It says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so as I read that, here's what the Lord said to me. This verse shows that Jesus was the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. I don't know if you understand what I'm really just saying. The Gospel of Matthew is, being, is starting off that in saying that Jesus is the son of David and that he is the rightful heir to the throne. Are, are you guys with me? It's saying that this is the heritage of a king. This is not a man. That's why it starts with Jesus Christ. And then it goes to David. And then it goes to Abraham. Because before Abraham was, I am. Are you with me? And so this, this is communicating that he is the rightful heir to the throne. And so what's very interesting is that Jesus suffered a profound uh, amount of injustice. So that justice would be satisfied and we could receive grace. How you respond to injustice will determine how you live. And it will determine that the inheritance that you live for other people. If you want to live with a chip on your shoulder, your kids will have one too. But if you want to make sacrifices, then your children will have an inheritance. Okay? Now, I want to share something because this is uh, rough. The other day on Facebook, I wrote, I said... The most dangerous thing that you can do is nothing. <laughs> and uh, that's really powerful if you think about it. Yeah. And, and the thing is, a lot of people are waiting for God, but in reality, God is waiting for you. Amen. That's religious lingo of really people who don't want to do anything. Okay. And they're complacent and satisfied doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's not, the, that's not the kingdom. The kingdom suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And so kingdom people are those who are moving forward at all costs, no matter what. If the gates of hell are prevailing, it's not the church. Uh, Amen. The gates of hell prevailing, it's not about uh, a defensive lifestyle. It's actually the opposite. Opposite. The gates of hell are here, and we're busting them wide open and loosing people. Yes. Okay? Amen. So the gates of hell, uh, you know, the gates of hell are at the local abortion clinic. Mm -hmm. Where children are slaughtering, where their, where their children are being slaughtered. Now the same age group, i got to tell you this now, the same group of people who uh, are killing their children, they're killing each other in gangs. Mm. Because the only way for that blood to be recompensed is by the blood of those who shed it. Wow. And they're captives and they're waiting for people to go and set them free. Mm. They're orphans who don't know they have a father. Approach situations a little differently. I'll give you an example. Maybe you don't need to go and scream and shout at them, but maybe you can go there with a $50 gift card and say, here's the first batch of diapers, don't kill your child. Right. We're here for you. Yes. You see, we have to come, and we have to come, be able to come to where people are at. Yes. And we have to learn how to minister to people. Yes. And so I'm going to throw things out at you, and I, I know that God is going to speak um, today. And so I just, I really want to encourage you guys uh, just to move forward. And I'm going to really try to do that by showing the consequences of actions that people take. I'm just going to just shift here and go somewhere else for a minute. But um, the, the decisions you make radically affect tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You understand? Because there's two people who took bullets in the head that you and I can sit in this room together and love on each other in the kingdom. Abraham Lincoln, a white guy who was a Republican, just to tell you. Mm -hmm. Conservative. All right? Took a bullet in the head. Martin Luther King. Two bullets in the head. Now we can sit in the room together. There's a great cost. There's a great sacrifice to bring unity. It comes by blood. It's really expensive. We have to value it. And so the decisions that they made radically affect our today. And the decisions that we make today really affect other people's tomorrow. There was 30 Marines killed in Afghanistan yesterday. Did you know that? Not only were there Marines, but there were Afghan soldiers who were with the Marines. 
and an interpreter. See? So people are really paying uh, for us to have freedom. And we have to value that freedom because it costs them their life. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like I said, the decisions that we make really, really affect people. Now, uh, like I said earlier, the most dangerous thing that you can do is nothing. I'm going to repeat that again. In the kingdom of God, there's only one direction, and that's forward. Are you with me? Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. All it does is increase, so get on board and learn how to move with God. God is not taking any steps backward. The kingdom of God is coming from heaven toward earth. It's coming through time and space, and it's knocking out anything in its way. That's what's happening. It's like a huge wrecking ball coming through time and space, destroying everything until Jesus' enemies are completely under his feet. You want to talk about the rapture? Forget about it. He's seated at his right hand, at the Father's right hand, until his enemies are at his footstool. <laughs> okay, that opened real quick. All right. So the danger that you know the danger with David is that David. Let me explain something about David. He was a man after God's own heart. When he lost the secret place, he lost the front lines. When he lost the front lines, his eyes were going somewhere they didn't need to go. He didn't just put his eyes on Bathsheba. He put a whole lot more than that. And then he killed the husband by sending him out to battle. Okay? So he had to continue to lie to cover up his sin. Sin is like an avalanche. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is he did that. Okay? So Nathan the prophet comes to him and then rebukes him with a parable. And so he responds wisely. He's one of the only kings that didn't kill the prophets. And so real apostolic people have, a, have an ear for the prophetic. It was an apostle who said, I wish all would prophesy, not, not a prophet. <laughs> you tell me you're an apostle, well, if you don't know how to embrace prophetic people, you're not an apostle. Mm -hmm. Moving forward. And he wound up moving backward. And so he went into sin, okay, and you know that. He slept with someone, he had them killed. I'm repeating myself just to rehash the story, all right? Mm -hmm. Then what happens? After the rebuke, he writes Psalm 51, a very profound psalm. But, see, it wasn't God didn't only forgive him. He did. But unfortunately, his actions had consequences. Yes. Okay? And those consequences are found, watch this, Matthew 1, verse 6. And Jesse begot David, the king of David, the David the king, and David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. David sinned winded up in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Often we're not remembered for our successes. Often we're remembered for our failures. <clears throat> Make wise decisions. Because the future will know about your life. You follow me? More people have read about Martin Luther King Jr. after he died. More people have shown interest in Abraham Lincoln after he's been dead for hundreds of years. More people have read Spurgeon's writings after he died. He sold more books after he was in the grave. See, we're living a legacy. We're leaving a legacy behind, and the choices we make really affect tomorrow. And so this sin winds up in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, which I find very interesting, especially if the gospel is all about grace and mercy, right? But in reality, the decisions we make affect everything. And so the thing is that David was from Bethlehem. And God said this word to David. He said, the sword will not depart from your house. Amen. Okay? Watch this. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. And all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. David was from where? Bethlehem. A whole city of children died and came under the sword of Herod because of his sin against God. Now, there's something that David understood that we have to understand. David said, against you and you alone have I sinned. Okay? 
but he didn't sleep with God's wife. God doesn't have a wife. Where is bride? You know, he who's what he slept with someone else's wife. But see, what David did is he connected that sin is a violation, an offense against God Himself because God Himself paid for sin. So David understood the personal uh, effects of a relationship with God in terms of sin. Now that's a huge thing. We have to understand that. And so David knew, according to Psalm 22, that Jesus would pay uh, on the tree. He saw the cross and he saw the, the suffering and he saw them gambling for his globe, uh, for his garments, but he saw it from the position of being in Christ. That's what Paul wrote about in Ephesians 1, that we're in him from before the foundations of the world, in love. So that deep, profound, you know, theological statement that Paul makes is experientially true with David in Psalm 22 because he saw from the Lord's perspective. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. Do you think that he would have done what he did? I don't think so. I don't think so. But I think it's important that we understand. I, I continue to say this because if you want to live in the kingdom, then you have to be accountable for the decisions you make. Yeah. Because Amen. they affect Amen. other people. Amen. We saw that with the children of Israel trying to go into the promised land. Mm -hmm. Okay? What happened? All the people who followed Moses died and didn't go into the promised land because he hit the stone a second time. Mm -hmm. The people you follow affect where you're going. Be careful. Mm -hmm. The people who follow you follow affect where you're going. Amen. So be careful who you're following. Yeah. Now, I, I want to say something here. Now, you may get upset with me, but that's okay. I still like you. When God spoke to Mary, uh, rather, when God spoke to Joseph, Joseph was not even in the natural father of Jesus. Amen. God did not speak to Mary. God spoke to Joseph. <coughs> God works in order. Joseph was responsible for the well-being of that family, and that's who God spoke to. Amen. I'm talking to women out there now. I'm not trying to be rude here, but I want to tell you something. If you want the, the blessing of God on your life, you have to understand order. And here's what I'm talking about. I'm not saying this in a sexist way. I'm saying this in a way that it's order that facilitates the blessing of God. It's like this. In the natural world, a river is a blessing. Okay? There's people starving to death, and they're dying because they don't have clean water. So the river that you see over here and all this water is a blessing that we have no comprehension of. Okay? And so this is a blessing. I go to villages all the time where people got to walk 20 minutes, a half an hour, two hours to pump water. Can't even take a shower. It smells like, you know, my feet. I mean, it's just rough. I'm just going to be honest with you. All right? And so you have this blessing here of this water, but it's order and it's boundaries that makes the blessing of that river sustainable. See, that river has boundaries which causes pressure, which means the water goes to a deeper body of water. If you, if you take those boundaries from without the water, it goes into dry parts ground. And that's how a lot of people live in their spiritual life, because there's not water in their life. Wow. Water is what facilitates a blessing in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show that. All right, now, as we continue, there's, okay, so John the Baptist is a very interesting guy. John the Baptist is a Levite, okay, who never ministers in Jerusalem. He never ministers in the temple. You know why? God wasn't there. That's a, you know, you understand, like for him to say, I don't want to be a Levite, you only are born into being a Levite. You don't carry Bishop Nobody's bag and become a minister. Okay, you don't study your Bible school online and into some sort of an ordination. Either you have that blood, either you're of that inheritance, yes, or you're not getting jack. Yes, Come on now. <laughs> Nothing. Come on and so he takes that and he lays it down and he puts it on that altar. And he put something on the altar and he gained something much better. Mm -hmm. He became the fulfillment of a prophecy of Isaiah. It's like he could have stood there and said, 
I am the word of the Lord. I mean, you are looking at the word of the Lord. I'm him. I mean, I mean that's amazing. This is the greatest prophet. Why? Because not because he did miracles. No miracles, but he's the greatest prophet. Why? Because God doesn't. Because miracles don't impress God. We're enamored with miracles. Listen, I can slap my wife, and you can see that lady healed. I can curse you out right now, walk outside, and start healing the sick. I know you don't believe that, but I know it to be true. Not because I do it, because the gifts of God are without repentance. Moses directly disobeyed God, and river and water still came from that rock. Because those people were thirsty, not because it was God's sign of approval on his life. Do not be enamored by miracles. Listen to the words that come out of someone's mouth. Because that will tell you what the spirit of thereof. The devil can do miracles. I know voodoo doctors in Haiti that was miracles. This is important. Miracles are not a sign of God's approval on anyone's life. That does not mean we're approved. John began to preach. One of the things I love about John is John is a radical guy. I don't get it. John is 20 miles outside of Jerusalem with no marketing, no advertisement, no website, no loudspeakers, no billboards. He's screaming, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And this guy is screaming. And people 20 miles away hear him and come out. There was supernatural strength on his voice because he had a word. Yeah. And God would bring people to a word. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Especially a word that's a, a word of transition. Mm -hmm. yes. And so he says, repent. And he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. So Jesus started his ministry with those very same words. Yes. Those words are this. Let me give you an example. Change the way you think. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Confession and repentance is different. Yes. We're going we're gonna to set that up now so that when I, when I continue on, we understand each other better. Conf the prodigal son... He, he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. That's confession. Mm -hmm. But he still thought he was going to be a slave in the father's house. And the father said, no, son, you don't know who you are. Let me change the way you think. I've got a ring for your fingers. I've got sandals for your feet. And I've got a robe. And so what he was saying is, son, I'm your covering. Yeah. Son, I'll bring you right back into covenant. Mm -hmm. And son, in Palestine, in those days, slaves do not wear shoes. Wow. Here's your authority back. Covering authority and covenant. Mm, okay. That should determine how we think. Blood covenant. Mm. Jesus Christ. He is our covering. I know that's people will say, well, people will say, who's your covering? I'll say, the shadow of his wings. <laughs> what are you trying to get at? Do I have a pastor? Yes, I do. Do I have a county? Sure, I do. But when I was in Haiti and the earth shook, my covering wasn't standing over my bed holding the wall back from killing me. My real covering was. Yes. Sir. Yeah. You get me? I was in Haiti when that thing shook. Mm -hmm. And I caught out of the bed, and the whole entire cinder block wall fell right on my bed. I got my Bible. I got my computer. I got my wedding ring. I got, the, I mean, I got everything. I lost a couple shirts. It was really rough. <laughs> but, uh, you know. And so, so that my, my covering was watching over me. So we need to change uh, the way we think. A lot of times we'll make religious protocols because we don't have spiritual discernment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul said, you know why Paul said, I love Paul because Paul is so smart. Yes, he's a brilliant man. I mean, he's just so intelligent. He says a lot of crazy things. But then I ask God, okay, well, what does he say? Where does he get this from? So Paul said this. He said, no, no man after the flesh. Mm -hmm. And what they didn't understand about his flesh is it was incorruptible. And it was sinless flesh. And it was not like any other flesh that ever stepped on this planet. It was God flesh. He's fully God and fully man. He's the man, he needs to sleep. He's God, he can sleep in a storm. That's who he is. That's who he is. And so, so John the Baptist comes on the scene. Okay, he's preaching. We know that, he's yelling. He's dressed weird. And um, you know what's crazy? As John preaches about Jesus, Jesus shows up. Mm -hmm. And he goes, baptize me. Mm -hmm. It's time to fulfill all righteousness. Mm -hmm. And so true prophetic preaching will manifest mm -hmm. the Lord and His presence. Yes. 
and there will be always a demonstration, there will be signs and wonders following an authentic message. The issue with us is we don't need to follow signs and wonders, they need to follow us. Okay. So John baptized Jesus. Now this is one of, I, you know, there's certain things about the scripture that I just will always repeat because I love uh, the truth and I value that truth so much that it's like, I could be talking about, you know, something else and somehow this will come up again. It's just like, I can't shake this loose. And I love this thing with John the Baptist and Jesus because John the Baptist was a Levite who never ministered in Jerusalem. Okay, which is like the first Levite ever who doesn't even minister in Jerusalem. Do you understand? And so, John the Baptist and Jesus are talking, and Jesus says, it's time to fulfill all righteousness. Meaning, it's time for you uh, to baptize me. And I said, Lord, what's that? And he said, Levites consecrate the lamb for Passover. And so, and so he caught that. And so, John the Baptist is a Levite who's setting apart the lamb for Passover is going to be slain. And the father goes three years and counting until he's slain. Because there's a time of separation that the lamb has to go through and you have to become familiar with the lamb before he's killed. I was listening to a pastor preach the other day and he's like, you know, they, you have to name the lamb. And then it says, oh no, we're eating fluffy. You know, because, because part of it is, is that you, you become, it becomes personal. God is a God of relationship and it becomes personal. And there is a sacrifice when you lose someone you love. And so this was a... The people who really loved Jesus and really were getting to know Him, they felt a real small part of the Father's pain of that separation. And they, they felt that. And so that, that was what God wanted them to feel. Because they were never going to feel it again. And so, John the Baptist preaches, Jesus shows up, the Lamb gets consecrated from Passover.